Um, presenter for the webinar. Dr. Tatum is a research scientist at Translational Research on Aging and Longevity at Department of Health and Kinesiology at Texas A&M. He has vast experience in HPLC and micro-LCMS um, method development and routine analysis. Today, uh, as Melissa mentioned, he will be presenting his experience in methods development and routine analysis of amino acids using micro LCMSMS and tracer stable isotopes. So with no further ado, I would like to hand it over to John uh, to present his talk. John, thank you. Thank you, Sibod, and thank you, Melissa. Um, welcome all, and I see some names on the list that I recognize, and to those friends of mine there, I extend a special welcome. Um, the um, interest of our uh, laboratory, the Center for Translational Research in Aging on, and Longevity on Amino Acids, is uh, one of our interests in uh, endogenous uh, usually macronutrients, things that are abundantly uh, present. Um, so detection, of course, is not an issue of these in terms of uh, sensitivity. However, at the same time, uh, we introduce tracers, which because of their cost and uh, their um, possible effects on metab metabolism itself, we uh, introduce in limited amounts. So it's a small molecule type uh, challenge that we have that uh, is in particularly dynamic range uh, type challenge. Um, trying to figure out how to go to the next page. Do I, yes, I see it, OK. Uh, Nicholas Dutz is our director. Um, I've been with uh, him for, um, well, since 2009, uh, first in Little Rock, Arkansas, and now in um, College Station, Texas. Um, and the group originally came from the Netherlands, from Maastricht. Uh, and we were uh, recruited uh, wholesale to come to Texas to continue the work. This is a statement by him which uh, summarizes at least the uh, amino acids and proteins aspect of our work. And I'd like to share with you another um, quotation, um, which is from a colleague of ours at the University of Vermont, Dwight Matthews, uh, which takes a slightly different tack, uh, state restating the problem. That people die of starvation, they generally do not die from lack of fuel, calories, but from a loss of protein. If you lose mo much more than 25% of your protein, then the critical functions of life will cease. The body regulates and conserves protein stores quite nicely, um, yet in injury and stress, or for example, after a um, moderately invasive surgery, the body uses protein for energy at an accelerated rate. We don't know why the body accelerates oxidation of amino acids in states of stress, trauma, and sepsis, uh, using protein stores to the point of, in some cases, being life-threatening. This is a common theme that runs through a number of diseases and, frankly, also uh, is involved with the normal aging process and uh, thus our interest in aging and those diseases. Tracer methodologies allow us to, it's, it's relatively straightforward to measure um, macronutrients in biological fluids. For example, one of our favorites being plasma. Um, but when you do that, no matter how well you do that, um, you, you can arrive at a, a wonderful statement of the concentration of those. And then perhaps if at the upper right, by working with uh, research animals, you can cannulate uh, surgically across different organs, and you can observe changes in concentration. So with these things, you can begin to uh, address things. But the power that you have uh, 
falls far short of what you can do if you introduce uh, stable isotopic tracer variants, uh, variants of the amino acids themselves uh, to the uh, study subject. This is typically done by infusion. Um, and in this case, it would be uh, amino acids. And uh, our study subjects are both human participants and also uh, various animals. If you then follow that up by collecting samples over time, um, perhaps after a um, environmental, I mean, I'm sorry, experimental intervention, then uh, you process those and chromatograph them. Then you, if you can, if you have a assay which can simultaneously detect both the uh, natural product, the amino acids themselves, which we call the tracees, and these introduced exogenous uh, isoto isotopes, which we call the tracers, in separate MRM channels as co then um, by integrating and fitting um, multi-pool models that are quite familiar to anybody that's worked in the field of uh, um, metabolic chemistry, uh, you can then calculate not only um, uh, concentrations, of course, you can uh, start speaking to rates of production, rates of disposal, rates of conversion to met uh, metabolites, et cetera. Uh, in this particular model that we show here, the top uh, uh, circle uh, is arterial extracellular plasma pool. Bottom one is the venous extracellular plasma pool. And to the right, tissue. So you can imagine the blood coursing through this material being brought into and out of cells. Uh, so you have an intracellular pool and then these other two pools. And uh, the way we can approach, we can certainly um, directly observe the two left ones. And then we can infer from that the intracellular pool. Of course, you know, the gold standard for, for asking questions of, uh, of, of, of this type is to uh, enlist a, um, re, uh, a subject for a matter of months and then to administer a particular uh, intervention that hopefully uh, improves the, um, the course of uh, maybe stops protein loss, uh, muscle loss, and then you can basically measure the um, change, the, the improvement. But you know that's difficult to do. So these are experiments that can be done in a matter of a few hours. At the lower right is a tool that actually um, uh, Dwight Matthews uh, it makes. And um, what this is, is it's simply a, a heater, which heats the arm of a human participant and, uh, in a sense, uh, arterializes the, the venous blood uh, simply by uh, causing more rapid exchange. Uh, it's not arterial, of course, but it, it, it has much more of the appearance of arterial. And this is well published in the literature. And so if one um, samples um, blood from uh, coming directly out of that box, and you get you can more or less address the upper uh, circle. If you sample the um, vein, perhaps in the other uh, arm, then you could detect the venous. And also, we use the same um, uh, uh, way to uh, if to put put in the infusions as well. Um, okay. Uh, topics that are amenable to this are uh, these. These are things we've actually been funded for. Uh, so one is optimal amino acid nutrition in sepsis, where you have some sort of a whole body um, uh, infection or something like that. This is a serious side effect of that, um, where you have muscle loss, wasting. Uh, st stimulated um, nitric oxide production and arginine deficiency in children with cystic fibrosis. Also, arginine de novo and, and nitric oxide production in disease states. Now, these are uh, pathways that lead to nitric oxide production, which have a lot to do with the relaxation, uh, the tonus of uh, blood vessels, and um, uh, a number of other health-related uh, uh, things. And this pathway can be addressed by looking at arginine and citrulline. Citrulline also has a, another function. We, mo we use that to monitor epithelial small bowel cancer treatment-induced injury. The um, metabolic integrity of the small intestine uh, can be uh, followed um, by looking at citrulline, since that is the site, the primary site of its uh, production in the body. Citrulline, of course, is not a structural amino acid. It's a physiological amino acid that's found in abundance in blood. Um, then finally, uh, we uh, 
combine our protein work with other, uh, looking at other interventions, isopentanoic uh, acid, as you might find in uh, fish oil, um, and looking at whether we can induce anabolism uh, or at least reverse muscle wasting in diseases such as COPD. Now, here's an example of a modern tracer protocol. Tracer pro protocols have been around for a while. And uh, so we would might have a person in for eight hours. And um, classically, uh, what you see here is sort of the classical um, tracer uh, protocol. So you might have an intervention or a placebo on the left, EPA and DHA given um, to the uh, uh, participant, or a placebo, uh, perhaps some soy oil, corn oil, something like that, um, olive oil. Um, and then um, you would begin an intravenous steady infusion of one or more tracers. The two that are shown here are quite typical. Um, the L-phenylalanine, uh, since um, it, it's, um, it, it's an essential amino acid and its um, alternate pathways, uh, uh, alternative to being incorporated into protein, are few. One of them is oxidation of that to tyrosine. And uh, so then what we do is we also infuse a different tyrosine isotope in order to follow um, and compare the, uh, what we'll then monitor is uh, for phenylalanine D5 uh, with five heavy isotopes. We'll monitor the tyrosine uh, with the um, 10 isotopes in this case, um, uh, 10 heavy atoms. And also we'll monitor tyrosine with, with uh, actually it's in that case, four, because one of the positions on the ring has been hydro hydroxylated, so you lose one of the deuterium, so we would uh, monitor tyrosine four. The outputs then would be muscle biopsies, might be muscle biopsies uh, done at various times, but uh, our mainstay are these blood samples, uh, carefully timed blood samples, uh, zero uh, before the infusion to get a baseline and then following that. Uh, our, our intention is to reach steady state with the infusion. Um, now, what I'll show you next is, is uh, some of the uh, things which uh, are more modern in their approach. And so one of the things you can do is you can sip feed, ask them to, uh, to consume a drink, a protein and carbohydrate drink that also has a, a tracer, in this case a different phenylalanine, uh, so that uh, we can uh, alter their fed state. So at first they're fasted, now they're fed, and we can begin to look at um, the effect under both situations. And this combined with intravenous pulses uh, given during that time um, allows us to really, um, so the, the classical way is getting a steady state and simply measuring the, uh, the, the, the concentration of the tracer in there versus the, uh, the tracee. But now you can, if you do pulses, then you can use um, some kinetic models and, and just model the um, appearance and then the rate of decline, the decay of these various things as they go in. And this is quite informative. It's quite new. And uh, we're very excited about this. Um, we, uh, in, th this, in this design, this example design, we have four pulses. And they're outlined in the bottom. So again, we, now we recruit a third isotopal phenylalanine. And we also bring in some other things, because the expensive thing, of course, is recruiting um, participants. So we want to get as much information as we can. So we can uh, look at uh, methyl L-histidine. Um, and uh, the hydroxyproline as a reporter of, of um, muscle uh, loss that's uh, specifically in um, muscle protein, glycine, L-arginine, and citrulline. And then the second one would be yet another phenylalanine. Um, so it's, it's clear, and it becomes clear that we need a method that can detect, individually detect these various tracers while at the same time measuring the tracee. Um, I won't labor this. Um, it, what's been appearing at the bottom in green is where this was first presented. This is now uh, being uh, in process. Uh, this uh, is used in a study in process now um, with, um, uh, with several of our researchers here. And if you wish to learn more about these approaches, there's an annual course. The next one is in uh, this year is, is in Sweden. Last year it was here at our site. And here's a website. Certainly, if you go to www.esten.org, 
you should be able to navigate to this uh, area where they talk. It should be right on the front page. And um, now, uh, we we use reverse phase HPLC. And we, we, we're using uh, triple quadrupole electrospray uh, mass spectrometry. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, the very polar uh, family of uh, amino acids um, is uh, difficult to uh, retain on a, a reverse phase column. So um, the derivatization, as long as the derivatization process is relatively straightforward, is something that um, can really uh, pay off. And uh, this is what we use, uh, the FMOC group, 9-fluoronyl uh, methyl, methyl oxycarbonyl chloride, um, which is uh, certainly well known because uh, this uh, one that you see in the middle, uh, the, the, this type of thing is sold readily uh, because these are the precursors used for um, peptide synthesis. Um, but we make them right on the bench, and uh, it's a 15-minute reaction, and um, you uh, get a high yield production of the thing in the middle, which is then chromatographed. And then during electrospray, we have the option of either uh, looking at the entirety of it or breaking it in a number of ways, two of which I show. Now, A, the breakage A um, on the right, uh, actually, you'll notice, regenerates the amino acid. So that's very handy. Now, at that point, we could uh, elect and, uh, to do more with that. And, or you can, as an alternative, uh, regenerate the amino acid plus an extra carbon and oxygen. It's an isocyanate of the amino acid. Both are high yield uh, uh, products. So this is quite handy for us. This summarizes, so the reaction is aqueous. It's well characterized in the literature. It's inexpensive, about a penny per reaction. The FMOC chloride is extremely inexpensive. Um, the resulting FMOC amino acids are stable in acidic and neutral solutions. They're easily chromatographed. They're efficiently ionized, both negative. You can see why negative. You know, if you look at the thing in the middle, you've blocked the positive charge of the amine, making more or less a peptide bond out of that, and you still have the free um, carboxyl. Um, but also in positive ion mode, usually as a um, ammonia addict or something of that nature, if you need that, they're highly fluorescent. If you want, if you need to follow up with fluorescence, and they're UV absorbent. Also, as I mentioned, they're commercially available. Finally, the fragment ions are high yield. They're producible both in, in both the collision center chamber and in the source itself. And uh, as I said, they you can easily regenerate the amino acid. Sample preparation, uh, we've really simplified this over the years. We used to do a, a, um, a solid phase extraction for this, but we find that this is unnecessary. The plasma on site in the preclinic or in the animal uh, facility is collected and immediately um, placed into a, um, a, vial, a, a, um, a, a tube, a one and a half mil Eppendorf tube that, con that already contains some acid. This is a vortex that turns milky meaning you denature the proteins, and you immediately store it at minus 80 degrees. It can be stored that way for months and months. There's not a problem. When we need it, we thaw it. And at that point, we do a very high speed centrifugation of that to pull down. I mean, most of the proteins come down readily, but um, to pull down as much as we can. And then the um, supernatant is sampled 20 microliters typically, but it can be as few as five or even three, um, and plus an internal standard um, which is um, the, um, a different set of isotopes of the amino acids. In, and that's uh, put in an equal amount. And then the FMOC reaction, reagent, I'm sorry, um, including a stop reaction at the end, which acidifies it and stops the reaction. The reaction goes for 15 minutes and is essentially done. It can all be done with repeating pipe headers quite quickly. It's a uh, completely standardized uh, condition that we do. Uh, uh, in all cases, we have an internal standard, but also uh, we have external standards. Um, and those are prepared in the same manner. We've done uh, tests to demonstrate that uh, we need not worry about the matrix effect of the plasma. We can do this with uh, the external standards commercially purchased um, isotopes, neat, in uh, just a slightly acidic solution. And then uh, the reaction is identical in that case. What this allows us to do is isotope dilution mass spectrometry. Um, and of course, anytime you're using electrospray, you have a lot of 
potential variables to account for, and this is the approach that's commonly accepted by referees to be able to do that. Uh, we use it both for our concentration assay and for our enrichment assay. In the case of concentration, each amino acid has an internal standard uh, put in with it. Um, and then the, rather than dealing with areas, we take the area ratio of the sample, multiply this by, uh, we have a series of the external standards prepared. And um, each one, we do the same thing. We measure the area of the, um, this should say, I'm sorry, this is wrong. In the numerator, it should say area of the tracy versus area of the ISTD there. That's incorrect. Um, we'll correct that um, before we release this. Um, and that's um, and then also we have the known concentration. So we set up a, linear, uh, a linearity uh, dilution series for that, uh, uh, draw a line, establish a model, and then apply that model to uh, determine, to convert a peak area or peak area ratio to actual reportable concentration. Likewise for enrichment assays, but in this case we have the area of the tracer divided by the area of the tracy. In a sense, this is an internally controlled um, uh, experiment because uh, as, as collected from the, um, the subject, we have both in there. So if, any, if, if the preparation uh, insults the sample in such a way that there are losses, under the assumption that the losses are similar, you don't have a problem. Um, however, in most cases, we also, in all cases, we include an external standard. It's uh, oftentimes quite simplified, and its purpose then is to uh, simply um, look at uh, the, um, to, to give us a read on what is the um, yield of the reaction, et cetera. But it doesn't appear in this, um, the internal standard, you notice, does not appear in this formula. What you have instead is, again, we have an external standard, but in this case, uh, the tracy, the, the normal amino acids, are not varied in their amount. But the ratio of the, of the tracer, the very same isotope, but in this case commercial, uh, commercially, directly from the, the commercial source, um, divided by the tracy is varied. So we have a range of enrichments. And uh, then, again, in a similar manner, we convert, are able to convert these tracy to tracy area ratios to enrichments in that manner. This is a picture of um, our, one of our uh, uh, pieces of equipment that we use. Behind it, which you don't see, is, a, is an older version of this uh, exigent. It's the, um, the one, the, just the previous generation. And uh, in, uh, in, in many ways, it's really quite similar. There are certainly decided improvements on the new one, but both are quite usable for what we do. To the right, you'll see an ABCX uh, triple quadrupole slash um, linear ion trap mass spectrometer. This happens to be their Q-trap 5500-5500. Um, oftentimes, this machine is on top, but we prefer to have it separate because one of the things we can do is on these audiovisual cards to simply move these to wherever we need them. So the other mass spectrometer, which is a much older ABCX behind this, uh, we may need to move this there. Or if we have a, a system uh, uh, downtime, we'll just simply move the older one over here and continue with what we're doing. The, um, our conditions for this amino acid rea rea um, uh, assay, LUNA is mostly water, 85%. The acetonitrile and isopropanol are in there primarily to prevent bacterial growth. Um, and then it has um, ammonium acetate. Um, and, and so LUNB is entirely acetonitrile. That works for us fine. And our gradient is a, um, uh, two linear gradients, one after the other. The first for 3.6 minutes, going from 19 to 22 percent B, um, and uh, it's 24 microliters per minute. And then um, from four minutes to five point, actually this should be 5.6. Well, it's actually this is right. I just collect for an extra 0.1 minutes. Um, is uh, 41 to 50 percent B, and uh, we we detect in most cases in negative ion. Um, MRM. Uh, we have the luxury of being able to divide the LC into uh, different periods and take the load off of the mass spectrometer. Uh, it only needs to observe a few of the amino acids at a time. 
the uh, non-varying parameters are the um, uh, ion spray voltage is minus 3,800. Tem the temperature is minus is uh, 160, 150 or 160. Uh, gas 1 is 13. Gas 2 is 25. Uh, the ranges of, of the amino acid specific parameters are for uh, the declustering potential minus 50 to minus 100, and the collision energy minus 10 to minus 35. We uh, use halo uh, columns, uh, 2.7 micrometer. These are, of course, um, uh, fused core um, type beads with the solid core. And our columns are 0.5 by 100 millimeters uh, and 55 degrees uh, Celsius in this small uh, column oven that you see right here, for those of you that are not familiar with the, uh, the system. So going through the system quickly, you from beginning to end, this is the, um, uh, the, path, the CTC part of the, it comes uh, when you purchase it, it comes with it. This is the cool stack. Uh, in, here are your samples kept to whatever temperature you prefer. Um, this is your this is a uh, manual controller, the, but the control is actually done by the computer, which you don't see to the left. This uh, is the robot needle, um, and uh, the wash station is here. This that this valve right here um, is um, uh, a special micro valve that uh, allows for very very um, a small amount of uh, uh, system uh, delay, system void volume, and uh, so you you inject directly into that, allowing directions uh, injections of very small amounts. And then your column is inside this uh, this oven, oven, and then uh, you go directly into the electrospray source. The electrode is a, a special electrode. The typical is 65 micrometer electrode is is in the source itself. It's the vertical part above the, the um, source. And uh, if you make that smaller, you get considerably tighter peaks. And there's two options there sold by Exigen to replace the 65 micrometer the, uh, uh, micrometer one. There's a 50 micrometer internal diameter, and there's a 25. Uh, we use the 50, but we've used both, and they both work just fine. This is 26 physiological amino acids. These are the tracees. In most cases, each of these peaks is doubled because it has the internal standard, but just for convenience of and being able to see it, because it's already a pretty busy slide. In this case, I've uh, extracted from the total um, uh, thing the, uh, just the, um, the natural uh, amino acids themselves. And you can see that, uh, so you start with some of the um, acidic ones, uh, and uh, you have uh, your base, most basic one, arginine, is right at 1.45 minutes. It's um, not so terribly large. You have some very small ones, like the uh, methyl L-histidine at about 1.25 minutes. You have the pi and the, um, and the um, tau. This is the, uh, actually, it should say, that should say tau there. I think it says pi. Uh, that should be the tau one. That's another mistake. Um, but the other one is just to the left of that. Um, you have, uh, in a second uh, set, you have methionine, valine, um, and in this case, I, I am showing that one internal standard, the L-valine D8 is, is there. Uh, the, you have an isobaric critical pair, uh, which uh, determines how quickly, it, it limits how quickly you can go. If you, you need to get enough chromatography to separate these, because these are isobaric. They cannot be detected. Uh, uh, differently by the mass spectrometer. Um, you uh, and they, by the way, the breakage is, is similar enough that it's really difficult even with MSMS. Um, there's tryptophan phenylalanine. In the next, you've got um, now after 4.2 minutes, everything that you see after that are um, amino acids which have received two F mod groups attached to them. In some cases, two and uh, they may be N N bis F mod, but in some cases. For example, the uh, tyrosine, that would be an NO bis F mod because the hydroxyl group on the tyrosine is reactable with it. Um, the, in the, there's copious literature on using F mod prior to, um, to uh, chromatography, but if you delve into it, keep in mind that most of it is uh, uh, really focused on producing a result that works for HPLC with fluorescence detection. Well, we have considerable advantages because our detector is far more selective. And um, 
in, in those cases, uh, there's, a, there's a strong effort, effort, for example, by Haynes um, et al., to remove these dis f mocks to reconvert them back to the mono f mocks and that can be done but in our case we're glad to have those out there because otherwise some of these move right into the busy section between one and two minutes where we really would prefer not to have them the next slide shows uh, the other arm of this assay which is uh, looking at enrichments uh, in this case uh, we're um, the the uh, matrix is equally complex complex in terms of the number of amino acids, but we're only detecting uh, 11, um, well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 different amino acids. And um, for those, 11 amino acid enrichments. And um, I'll give you an example of the, from the second period. Uh, the first uh, peak is uh, citrulline, and it's a family of the citrulline isotopes. And the arginine is the second peak. Um, if you look, if you do the, this is the TIC in the middle, if you look at the bottom, I've done the extracted ion chromatogram, and it shows four transitions. Uh, notice in the middle that um, the arginine is getting up towards the, uh, detect, it's not at detector saturation, it's, which is maybe at three times 10 to the six. So we're comfortably below it, but um, it's a good strong peak. Um, notice below that the red and the green are fairly weak peaks. However, um, using MultiQuant with Signal Finder, uh, which I would recommend anybody look at. This is um, an alternative to uh, the analyst quantitation. It's a separate piece of software, MultiQuant. And within it, the algorithm Signal Finder is um, it's quite unique. There's nothing else out there that takes that approach. It's a, mod uh, a peak shape modeling approach, and uh, you and it, it reports signal to noise quite conservatively, but um, it does a superb job uh, in our tests of um, approximating reality with, um, with our experiments. In this case, this is sufficiently over, uh, uh, over the background that we're able to actually get some numbers from this. Why are they so low? These are not tracers. These are metabolites of tracers. Um, this is um, a um, uh, arginine... Um, M plus 3, the red is an arginine M plus 5. They both come from a citrulline M plus 3 and M plus 5. That is the green and the gray. So that's about the level that we're aiming for for our tracers. But then uh, following those through a metabolic pathway, we may end up having to measure something that's considerably lower. The green that you see at 1.45 is a uh, cross-reaction. Uh, we don't need to quantify that. That happens to be uh, that uh, it's an M, it's, it's an M plus one of the M plus three, I believe, in this in this case, and we don't need to look at that. Um, I'd like to sh have another. Uh, oh, am I missing a slide? Hmm. Interesting. I expected to see a slide here. I will just simply tell you, ornithine. If you'll look out at the top on here at 4.5 minutes. Um, is um, also has um, some metabolites of tracers um, underneath it, and they're also quite small. I had a slide which shows uh, ornithine, which, by the way, is too strong, and I actually had to roll off or de-optimize one of the voltages on it to keep it within the um, the saturation range of the instrument. Um, this works fine. Um, you can do test experiments to determine whether or not you still get robust. Uh, numbers from doing that. This allows the uh, tracer metabolites to be a large enough underneath there to be able to see. And what that one reports is that we're in those ca in the in that case we were able to uh, readily detect it was well over uh, the the peak for the meta metabolite of the tracer uh, looked more like the uh, the green and the gray peak down below. They were well over background, and yet we were able to measure an enrichment of 0 0.0004 um, in, in that case. And uh, the, uh, it, calculating the on-column load of the um, tracer metabolite was uh, 0.05 femtomoles. And it, it worked just fine in that case. I'm going to back up two here and mention, I, for, I neglected to put in my um, in my uh, conditions here, 
uh, the size of our injection. So we use what's called, uh, this is a really wonderful thing about the exigent systems, they, allowed, they allow for uh, metered injections. So I have mounted on here uh, at this point a 1.77 microliter uh, column loop. Sounds like an odd number, but I frankly don't care. It can be almost anything there. Because what I'm doing is I'm, oh, I'm uh, pulling from my sample. Fortunately, I have enough to pull adequately to overfill that uh, loop. But if I didn't, I would simply make the loop smaller. I overfill the sample loop. And then um, I, open the, I have the machine open the valve only long enough to inject part of what's in the loop. Um, and by the way, you can include an air gap at the beginning of, in your needle so that you can ensure that everything is absolutely in there. It's all programmable in the, uh, in the auto sampler. Um, and uh, so the, uh, using metered injection, for concentrations, it's typical that we inject um, anywhere from 70 to 125 nanoliters of the uh, material from the 1.8 microliters. And uh, for tracers, where we would like the signal to be higher, we may choose to inject uh, somewhere on the order of 250 to as much as 400 nanoliters. Uh, of course, the amount you can inject depends on the strength of your uh, solution that you have your samples in. And you can really use a large um, loop and inject quite a bit if that's what you need. All right, I'm, uh, the decision uh, that we made to go with micro uh, LC was back in 2009, actually. Um, and these were some of the things that we weighed at that time. Uh, and um, so first, at the top, I show you a, to give you, to let you know uh, what micro LC is. Um, you have, uh, so ours is a 10 centimeter, 100 millimeter long column. And uh, we, our assay that we were converting, uh, we were using a 3.0 millimeter ID column. And we were, at that time, also using the HALO 2.7 micron uh, beads. And uh, we first tried to convert that to a 1 millimeter column using the uh, early generation exigent machine. Um, and then we elected to go to an 0.5, and that's we've stayed with that ever since. Uh, the second row here is the swept volume. So the swept volume of a, of a half millimeter column is 11.8 uh, microliters. This is assuming uh, an 0.55 to 0.6 uh, void volume relative to the total volume within the column, which is standard uh, assumption to make for these types of calculations. Whereas for the 3.0 millimeter, it was 424. So we're looking at something something like a uh, what a 35-fold uh, difference there, or something on the order of that. Um, okay. Um, pros and cons of the micro system. So the pros, and this was a big one for me, uh, if you've done LCMS or even just LC, especially LCUV sometimes, you'll, you're, you can be quite disturbed by the pulsations you'll see in your baseline. For us, with the very small peaks we need to detect, uh, having a, a, a regular, regular pulse in that baseline there, so take the red baseline. The, the, the pulse, sure, you see variation there, but it's not a regular beating. You don't see a very thick, heavily drawn line there because of a very rapid pulsation. It simply doesn't exist. And it's because of the very unique nature of these, these pumps. They do not reciprocate. They don't go push, pull, push, pull during the push, reload, push, reload during the, uh, the um, process. They're like a big syringe pump. They're like a big um, uh, a syringe that you would stand there manually and pump in. So there's no pump noise. And th thus, for MS, your electrospray Taylor cone is extraordinarily stable. This, for us, was almost a deciding factor right there. But the delivery flow rate is extremely precise. And this is in part because of the pump design, but also in part uh, because of the very small void volume of these systems. Um, the, uh, our calculation of our void volume uh, with the um, with the, 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 the system void volume, not including the 11.8 swept volume of the uh, column, is uh, something on the order of 2.4 microliters. Now, you take that, multiply, multiply by 35, so you, uh, 70 microliters. Uh, you'd have to have a system with 70 microliter um, void volume to be able to get 
a similar performance in terms of peak narrowness for this thing here. Well, our system certainly was not 70 microliters. There are systems out there that are like that, but even some of the high ones are over 100. The, con um, the cons um, is that it is a syringe pump, and it's not an infinitely sized syringe pump. Each side of the pump is uh, holds 0.6 mil. So this means for us, um, we get about 50 column volumes uh, from the syringe pump per side before the analytical part of the gradient needs to stop. Uh, you, I try, we tried having one longer and allowing for a restroke event or a refilling event, but it, it, it doesn't work so well. However, I will add that if you can finish your analytical part during the 0.6 mils, then you're fine for the rest of it. Uh, you're doing just fine there. It'll, you can allow that. The delivery flow rate is not fully accurate if an eluent contains two solvents, great more than two solvents. And this is because the uh, system um, is um, uh, doing calculations to get its flow rate. However, keep in mind, precision in this case is far more important than that accuracy. If not, it doesn't affect your reproducibility at all. It affects what you're reporting in your method section. And, and you notice I have um, a ternary system. I, my A buffer has both isopropanol and acetonitrol, but it's not a problem. I need to move a little quicker here, so we'll proceed through this. Reduce downtime and repair costs. There's minuscule pump wear because there's no reciprocation. There are no check valves. It's done entirely by microfluidics. Um, why doesn't the A buffer go into your B side? Because the B side is maintaining enough uh, pressure to not let that happen. There's slower following of the MS source and the Q0. And the auto sampler, as you saw in the picture, is entirely out there. It's right in front of you, so you see immediately. It's not stuck in a box where you have to send it away to get it fixed. There's fewer micro LC experts for hire, that's for sure. But the learning curve is not terribly high. So if you get a good analytical chemist in, you're in good shape. It's very programmable, the auto sampler, which is important for us because we, we do a lot of that. Um, however, advanced, sam advanced programming requires a software purchase. It's a CTC. Uh, program. And uh, so if you're ordering, you should uh, uh, ask uh, your salesperson to price that as well. It's greener. We were able, we, we got pallets full of acetonitrile to do our work before this. And now um, I looked over the last four years, we've used uh, uh, 75 uh, uh, liters of this for uh, mobile phase use. It's just amazing how, how much you can cut it down. Numerous performance advantages, and I can't go into this here, but uh, the exigent.com website is excellent for this. Um, they have very convincing, uh, good uh, research showing uh, the advantages. But they, uh, uh, enumerating quickly, you have this uh, incredibly low swept volume of the system. The dispersion is extremely low. Um, the, um, that allows you to, uh, to go quite more quickly with your, your um, uh, with your uh, system. And uh, it, it is a UHPLC system in the sense of being able to deliver 10,000. It's not 15,000 to 18,000, but hey, I'm using um, halo columns. I don't care. I run at 4,500, and I'm perfectly happy. It's less compatible with APCI, APCI because that source, uh, there's more uh, volume in the source. And so there will be some dispersion. But if you run up around 50 or 80 microliters, you can still get results doing that. Um, amino acid stable isotopic enrichment. Oh, here's that pesky slide. So we're going to skip this because I covered it. But um, here's just an example of what that L-ornithine uh, looked like in this case. Um, so it's a good peak, and we get this kind of enrichment. And uh, I'm sorry, I was mistaken. It's 0.5 femtomoles. To summarize, since uh, mid-2010, when we received our first equipment, we've had two generations of the exigent micro-LCs that have been excellent platforms for high-throughput amino acid measurement. The number of injections we've done is about 50,000. The number of columns we've used, about 30, exactly 32. Um, the average number of injections per column is 1,500. Uh, injections uh, per sample. Uh, is two to six, depending on the number and identities of tracers. We simply sometimes have to do, um, usually it's, it's two, one for concentrations, one for tracers. Sometimes it's three, sometimes four, but it's been as many as six. 26 amino acids, it took us 42 minutes in the analytical part of that to do it before. Now it takes 5.6 minutes. 
uh, we um, allow plenty of time for the uh, regeneration of the column. We actually do a double regeneration, going up high to low to high to low in terms of percent B. This allows us to uh, get lower carryover and allows us to uh, do what's called scatter washing of the other parts of the valve which are not otherwise washed. If you draw a picture of a valve and think about it, you're not washing the whole valve unless you do this. This is something that was um, pioneered by uh, Leap Technologies and uh, CTC PAL, and uh, it's quite easy to implement. However, in order to do it, we did need to buy the software for the uh, auto sampler. The cost, uh, $3.53 per injection. Most of that, you'll see that it's $2 of that is instrument depreciation and service contract costs. Subtract the $2, and you've got uh, column costs, the FMOC reaction, LC and MS consumables, and plastic wear. Hands on labor time at the bench, uh, 2.3 minutes per sample. That's because it's so uh, parallelized. We have the whole thing set up in, in large uh, trays, flats of these things, and we can just use a multi-petter and go through it very quickly. Um, we use a um, tube vortex or to vortex things during the reaction. We don't put lids on for the reaction. It just stays off. It's an aqueous reaction. It's not a big deal. Um, the mobile phase solvent, um, we save about 90, maybe 95 percent. And uh, the acetonitrile volume used, I think I mentioned about um, 75 uh, liters. No, I, I'm. Don't quote me on that. I think it might be a little more, but it's really way down from what what we had before. We um, were unable to maintain our service contract for a period for our first system. After it expired, we used that system for three years straight without a pump failure. These pumps don't suffer. It's like a cassette tape player versus a, um, uh, an MPG player, really. It's almost like that. Related progress and further directions. First of all, there's method papers in preparation about this. And if you plan to implement this, I would um, request that you drop me a line. Um, I would like for you eventually to uh, cite uh, the proper paper for that. Um, but they're in preparation at this time. Other biological fluids and protein hydrolysates, these methods are already established. Uh, protein hydrolysates are quite challenging because the incorporation of these tracers into muscle, et cetera, is quite low, a bit lower. So we have to play some tricks with dynamic range to make that happen. There's inline FMOC reactions that we've considered. We have, um, we've modified the system in order to do that. But frankly, we've improved our bench top uh, procedures to such an extent and the stability of the reaction products that we are, are, this is not a high priority. Finally, we're moving into looking in, at enantiomers of amino acids. And one of the approaches we, we're considering is micro LC, a micro-LC-based approach. I think that's it. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Sue Boat. Uh, thank you, John, for, for the excellent presentation. Um, now uh, we'll take some uh, questions. So we are in the Q&A session. And there are quite a few questions coming through the web. Um, and I will, I'll go through, go through them. So the first question is, uh, what solvent is used in preparation of internal standards? Yes, that's a good question. Um, the, um, the internal standards are made up in uh, 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid, which is a standard uh, nice way to preserve amino acids uh, from 0.1 to 0.5 molar HCl. Uh, this allows us to um, store them if we ne if need be, and the acid that's in there is a somewhat uh, lower pH than the acidity of our um, deproteinized uh, protein supernatants. So, if necessary, we will adjust the uh, pH of our buffer that we use for our reaction using a slightly different uh, buffer uh, pH for the reactions for the. Um, external standards. Oh, I'm sorry, you asked about internal standards. Again, that's 0.1 molar uh, HCl in, in both cases. But uh, as I was saying, we, we sometimes, we want to make sure that the final pH of the reaction in all cases is in the range of 9.5, roughly. It's fairly loose. Okay. The, the next question, I think you answered that in one of your slides, uh, was about uh, how stable is the column and what is the column life? 
Yes. Uh, the um, these um, these and uh, these eight, uh, hillet columns, the ones that I purchase, are um, poured by Exigent themselves, and we've always gotten them from Exigent. Uh, they do a superb job of pouring these, um, and uh, as long as so the halo material is rated uh, to a, um, a pressure of uh, uh, 6,500 psi, at which time you can't count on the beads uh, remaining intact. You might start fragmenting beads or whatever. I would not rec recommend getting within a thousand of that. So uh, we keep our uh, pressures at about 5,500, typically running more at 3,800 to 4,500. When you do that, um, the uh, columns are, are quite stable. In early on, our experience was that we, um, our columns would uh, gain uh, in pressure. But then uh, we uh, have not found that to be the case so much lately. Uh, we are uh, uh, we don't take very many pains to uh, uh, ensure there aren't particulates and things. Nothing more than I would do with an analytical system. But um, we must be doing it better. Our F mock reaction can generate some particulates, so um, we simply allow for gravity settling, and then I I pull from uh, high in the uh, vial insert to. Uh, prevent getting those in. And that seems to make a big difference. So the columns, as I say, they typically last about 1,500. And the, uh, the end of uh, the column, what spells the end of the column is a slight reduction in retention time accompanied by a spreading in peak width uh, where I, we start losing. The canary in the mine, I guess you would say, is the um, isoleucine-leucine separation. We can immediately tell the status of the column from that. So the column life is about 1,500 of these injections. All right. So thank you, John. Uh, another question is, um, what acid do you use for protein precipitation? It's variable. Um, it, it doesn't, as, as long as I take do a preliminary experiment and determine the residual acidity in the supernatant, it's quite straightforward to uh, simply neutralize that for the reaction. So we have done, uh, uh, our, our usual now is uh, uh, trichloroacetic acid, TCA. Uh, we've also done many, many samples using uh, sulfosalicylic acid, SSA. Uh, I've not tried uh, PCA, but I have no uh, reason to think that that would not work as well. OK, next one is, um, can that smart chemistry be used for urine samples? Uh, oh, to to go in urine. Yes, um, uh, I did this early on and uh, was certainly able to see reaction products. Uh, really, the only requirement that the reaction has is that there be no um, alcohols in there, which would compete uh, for the um, FMOC, and that the pH be in the range of uh, nine to. 10.3 or something like that. As long as you can meet those requirements, it will work. And so you can, it's quite feasible to do it directly in urine. Um, we've discussed doing that, but we've not done it so much. But I have, I have done a few like that. OK. Uh, another question is, are you using any guard column? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this was a major concern of mine uh, early on, um, because uh, the, the, the micro guard column has, uh, appears to have been something that has been relatively challenging for um, manufacturers to produce with sufficient quality that they would not uh, introduce uh, band dispersion, uh, I'm sorry, peak dispersion into uh, your system. I actually was uh, participated in a beta test uh, where um, I was sent, uh, oh, must have been a dozen different uh, generations of one company's uh, attempt to do this. And they got close, but they didn't quite get there. Um, I'm happy to report now that um, Exigent is just releasing a micro guard column for the systems. And uh, I've not yet seen the, um, the data on this, but I'm told that uh, they do this uh, with uh, really not much uh, effect on dispersion. So I certainly will be happy to try that. But we do not use guard columns at this time. And uh, that's, um, we, we simply, 
uh, you know, I would prefer to do it, but we and and I have tried it, and uh, under conditions where I don't need that much uh, 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 resolution, I certainly have done it, and and I've used the best of what's out there. Um, uh, Exigent Optimize is another company. Uh, you can also investigate um, uh, Merck uh, has some. Uh, uh, some things that are really more designed for the uh, nano field, but there's a, a version there that can work. These are quite quite doable, but as I say, we we have done pretty well without them. All right. And one last question, as we are almost running out of time, and this oh, question yeah. is, um, this question is, have you tried positive mode, and uh, can any other C18 column be used? The answer to both is yes. Uh, we started out using uh, different uh, C18 columns, and it works fine. You simply don't get as much resolution as, it, as if you were to use an, a UHPLC column, in this case a fused core column. And also, um, we, uh, I commonly do use positive mode. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, that this can be done. What you're detecting in that case, in most cases there, um, with the exception of arginine, which gives a nice positive signal with no um, cluster, uh, clus with no um, uh, clustering, um, but most of them are detected as your choice of the um, uh, ammonia adduct, the sodium adduct, the potassium adduct. We typically go with the ammonium adduct on that, and then strip it off uh, in the in the source. And uh, you can uh, that's it's quite it's it's one of our regular strategies to do that. And also, by the way, I, I should add that, that the, uh, the polarity switching on these uh, AB SIX machines is fast enough that in many cases I can simultaneously detect the negative and the positive. I'm willing to sacrifice the 50 milliseconds of, of uh, lost time, lost uh, uh, cycle time to do that in some cases. All right, John. Thank you very much. And I think uh, there are